Spatial Humanities is a five-year European Research Council funded project whose main ambition is to investigate how digital tools developed in the fields of geography and corpus linguistics can be adapted to enrich the study of history, literature, and the arts. Primarily, our work focuses on developing techniques for analyzing large collections of books, newspapers, and official reports within a Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, environment. Essentially, GIS is a type of computer application that allows the user to identify, map, and analyze the geographic information contained in a given set of data or statistics. Broadly speaking, geographic information consists of two components, a spatial component, such as a place name or location, and a thematic component, which assigns some attribute to that place name or location. Think, for instance, of a census, which is essentially a data set comprised of thematic descriptions, demographic descriptions, economic descriptions, etc., that are organized in terms of discrete spatial units, such as parishes, towns, and boroughs. A GIS application is a tool for bringing these different strands of information, the spatial and the thematic, together, and for examining correlations between them. From a technical perspective, this process involves geo-referencing the data set or using a gazetteer to assign each piece of spatial information a set of geographic coordinates. Once geo-referenced in this way, the data set can then be mapped and displayed in different thematic layers or groupings. One of the benefits of working with GIS is that in allowing the user to visualize the geography underlying a complex set of data, it helps one more effectively to detect spatial patterns and relationships in that data. In the field of historical epidemiology, for example, GIS has proven to be extremely useful for studying the outbreak and spread of past epidemics, and thus for tracing trends in uh, disease and mortality. Recently, however, researchers have begun to apply GIS to study other kinds of geographical phenomena, including literary and artistic representations of specific places and landscapes. Between 2007 and 2008, members of our project team, along with Professor Sally Bushell, conducted a pilot study to test the interpretive possibilities of using GIS to map out historical accounts of the English Lake District. The Lake District, for our purposes being broadly conceived as comprising the old counties of Cumberland, Westmoreland, and Northern Lancashire, is an ideal focus for a study that uses GIS because it's a region that has long been portrayed in poems, guidebooks, and paintings. One thinks of Wordsworth and Turner, of course, but one can also think of an array of writers and artists, from Celia Fiennes and Daniel Defoe to Alfred Wainwright and the Abraham Brothers, all of whom have shaped our perception of the Lake District and its landscapes. The study our team conducted five years ago sought to show how GIS technology could help researchers analyze historical accounts of the Lake District and explore how representations of the region have changed over time. This study focused on two canonical accounts of the lakes, Thomas Gray's epistolary journal of his tour of 1769 and the letters and notes Samuel Taylor Coleridge composed during his ramble through the Western Fells in 1802. Creating a GIS of these two texts, which together comprise some 20,000 words, involved a four-step process. First of all, we had to digitize each text, and then read through them to identify every place name reference they contained. These place names were then manually coded using extensible markup language and divided into groups to distinguish the places Gray and Coleridge had visited from those they merely mentioned. Once tagged, annotated, and arranged in this manner, the list of place names was then cross-referenced with the Ordnance, Survey one, Ordnance Survey's 1 to 50,000 gazetteer, which contains coordinate information for every place name marked on the OS's land range of maps. The fully georeferenced list was then read into a GIS application, in this case ArcGIS, to create a series of map layers displaying the places documented in Gray and Coleridge's tours. As you can see, although these two tours are ostensibly accounts of the same landscape, a GIS mapping of them reveals a set of radically divergent spatial experiences. Gray's tour was a 15-day trip by coach and horseback from Bruff to Lancaster via the picturesque scenes of Oldswater, Derwentwater, and Grasmere. Coleridge's tour, by contrast, was a nine-day odyssey taken on foot from the writer's house in Keswick to the coastal village of St. Bees, and thence famously over Scoffell Pike to Eskdale and Coniston, before returning homeward over Dunmail Rays.
In a certain sense, these contrasting routes would seem to complement the contrasting temperaments of the two authors themselves, with Gray's linear measured movements countering Coleridge's more erratic meanderings. Yet these routes can also be seen to indicate crucial differences in touristic attitudes and practices. Gray's account, though famously one of the earliest documents of its kind, exemplifies many of the tendencies of later picturesque tourism in the Lake District. Gray traveled on coach roads and a route that took him through densely populated areas to sites of visual grandeur and beauty. He was, in so many words, an outsider who came to the lakes with a clawed glass in his pocket and an itinerary in his hand. Coleridge, by contrast, was a resident of the region at the time he set off for the western fells, and his irregular route would seem to reflect a desire to avoid well-trodden paths and instead to seek new experiences and sensations. In short, whereas Gray was rather unabashedly what we would call a tourist, Coleridge would have likely seen himself as a traveler. The comparative base map projected here offers a visual corroboration of this general impression. Top maps such as this, however, can be difficult to read, which is something that we've compensated for here by inserting lines between the places Gray and Coleridge visited. In order to interpret the geography embedded in each of these texts more effectively, it's useful to employ analytical mapping techniques, such as density smoothing, which is a common method for identifying clusters of spatial events. As you can see on the slide here, density smoothing works by generalizing the distribution of the dot map to indicate the relative frequency of events, in this case, place name references. The higher the frequency of references in an area, the denser the clustering in that area. Using these maps helps us to visualize the general field of awareness, if you will, that shaped Gray's and Coleridge's accounts, and it draws our attention to a number of indicative patterns, including Gray's predilection for more populated areas such as the towns of Kendall, Keswick, and Penrith, and Coleridge's attraction to more isolated spots. As you can see, when looking at the map of Coleridge's tour, the eye is instantly drawn to the cluster east of Wasdale Head, near the point where Scoffell Pike runs down into the remote valley of Eskdale. The gradation of Gray's map, by contrast, indicates that he devoted most of his attention to places near Keswick, where he spent a total of six nights during his tour. More information about this pilot study can be found on our project's website. For the present purposes, it suffices to say that noticing these sorts of patterns has convinced us of two things. Firstly, that working with GIS can help us begin to assess the experiences of individual travelers, and secondly, that whereas the Lake District is a region unified by a common set of associations, historical accounts of the lakes can be surprisingly heterogeneous. This, in large part, is what motivates our current research. Effectively, we're in the process of creating a fully georeferenced digital corpus to analyze the development of the Lake District as a cultural landscape between the early 17th and the early 20th centuries. To date, our corpus consists of 80 digitized texts comprising well over a million and a half words and spanning from the 1622 edition of Michael Drayton's Polyolbion to the 22nd edition of Black's Schilling Guide to the English Lakes, which was published in 1900. The full list of texts includes a number of well-known works, such as the guidebooks of Lakeland luminaries like Wordsworth and Harriet Martineau. Importantly, however, it also features the works of dozens of lesser-known writers, including Priscilla Wakefield, W.G. Collingwood, and the Lancashire dialect poet Edwin Waugh. This mixture of sources is significant because one of the main benefits of working with large corpora of historical books is that it allows us to generate more historically nuanced interpretations. By situating canonical texts such as Wordsworth's Guide alongside popular tourist publications such as Black's Schilling Guide, we can perform far more comprehensive analyses of how the Lake District was perceived, experienced, and represented in the past. In order to facilitate these analyses, we've also begun to utilize new mapping techniques to create better models for understanding the journeys of historical Lake District tourists. Now, to give you one example, as you've now seen, in the pilot study, we use straight lines to represent the itineraries described in Gray's and Coleridge's tours. This connect the, the dot strategy does portray the sequence of places that each author visited. However, the linear geometrical shape it produces gives us at best a superficial understanding of how the Lakeland landscape shaped their accounts. As we see it, we need to move beyond this kind of point-based mapping by employing techniques that can help us more adequately to represent how travelers move through and experience the Lake District in the past.
Recently, we've completed an initial case study using a GIS-based approach called cost surface analysis, which is similar to the software used by route planners like SatNavs to create more accurate representations of the routes traveled by and described uh, by Gray and two other famous 18th century Lake District tourists. The English agriculturalist Arthur Young, who paid a visit to the lakes on his six-month tour of northern England in 1768, and the Welsh naturalist Tom Thomas Pennant, who passed through the region during his two tours to Scotland in 1769 and 1772. Our decision to work with the accounts of Gray, Young, and Pennant was not arbitrary, but based on the fact that they are the three chief authorities at Thomas West sites in his highly influential A Guide to the Lakes of 1778. The foundational work in the history of Lakeland tourism, West's guide sold through an unprecedented 11 editions and was still being reprinted more than 40 years after its initial publication. It was, moreover, the text through which most, uh, through which most late 18th century and early 19th century Lake District tourists first encountered Gray, Young, and Pennant's writings about the region. It's worth noting, however, that West's guide only reproduces portions of each of these three writers' accounts, and thus only gives us a partial glimpse of the geographies depicted in their tours. So, in reconstructing the routes that Gray, Young, and Pennock traveled, our aim was really to provide a more focused look at Lake District tourism in the era before the region developed into a popular tourist resort during the late 1770s. Creating simulations of the tours that Gray, Young, and Pennant involved building a GIS similar to the one used in the pilot study, the only difference being that this time, all of the places tagged as having been visited were arranged sequentially in a table to form an itinerary for each text. Once arranged in this manner, the place names were geo-referenced, uploaded into ArcGIS, and analyzed using cost surface analysis to determine the routes each writer followed between the various places through which they passed. Now, as I mentioned before, cost surface analysis works like route planning software to determine the optimal route between two locations based on variables such as time, mode of transport, and the conditions of the terrain being traversed. In essence, it allows us to automatically chart the route that will cost the least amount in terms of whatever factors we've selected. In our experiment, we used slope uh, based on a digital elevation model as a principal cost determinant. And this enabled us to create a series of maps displayed here showing the least cost path between the different places that Gray, Young, and Pennant passed through. We then compared these routes with those described in each of the writer's accounts and discovered uh, that they matched the route, the route simulated and the route one can infer from reading the text matched practically point for point. One of the most significant insights gained from examining these maps is that all three writers, without exception, relied on local carriage roads and turnpikes. Initially, this may seem like a minor point, but it is of manifest importance. For, although scholars have long credited the accounts of early Lakeland travelers, such as John Dalton and George Smith, with attracting tourists to the region, they have generally paid far less attention to how improvements in the local rail roadways during the 1750s and 1760s influence those tourist movements and thus their accounts. As Paul Hindle, one of the very few exceptions to this trend has observed, the influence of these improvements was twofold, for they not only established standard routes that afforded swifter and safer access to several of the region's main settlements, but also, in doing so, distinguished the places connected by or at least visible from those routes as the sites most worthy of the tourists' attention. Accordingly, Looking at the maps shown here, it makes sense that the parts of the landscape identified amongst those most frequently traveled are located in the eastern half of the region, generally speaking around the lakes of Durant Water, which is A, Oldswater, B, and Windermere, C, since these were the sites around which the majority of road improvements occurred. Concurrently, this also helps to explain why neither Gray, nor Young, nor even Pennant, who traveled through much more of Cumberland than the other two, set foot in the now iconic western valleys of Wasdale and Ennerdale. For although turnpike acts were passed to improve access to this area in 1750 and 1762, the roads in this remote part of the country remained in disrepair well into the 19th century.
Indeed, where his West writing in 1778 could confidently declare that the roads throughout the Lake District had been much improved since Mr. Gray made his tour in 1769 and Mr. Pennant his in 1772. As late as 1821, his guidebook, then in its 11th edition, still cautioned tourists that the roads leading into Ennerdale and Wasdale were as yet unimproved. So, in the first instance, mapping the routes that Gray, Young, and Pennant followed shows us that they chiefly went where the local carriage roads and turnpikes enabled them to go. But how, we might rightly ask, did those roadways shape their impressions of the places through which they passed? Cultural historians have often remarked with due amusement that Lakeland tourists in the late 1700s moved from scenic vista to scenic vista collecting sensations much in the same way that modern tourists collect snapshots and souvenirs. Significantly, however, histories of the Lake District tend to quote passages from 18th century travelogues and guidebooks without commenting on the material conditions that determine the writer's point of view. Thus, whereas Gray's famous description of Grasmere's peace, rusticity, and happy poverty is regularly cited as an archetypal display of picturesque sentiment, Few scholars have bothered to note that the poet's perspective of the village was determined by his having first seen it from the prospect of the road over Dunmail Rays on a sunny October afternoon. This is precisely the sort of empirical detail to which mapping the tours of Gray, Young, and Pennant helps to alert us. Permit another example, uh, this one from Gray, sorry, from Young and Pennant's accounts of their journey over Shapfell to carry the point. Here is Young. Twelve of the fifteen miles from Shap to Kendall are a continued chain of mountainous moors, totally uncultivated. One dreary prospect that makes one melancholy to behold. Similarly, Pennant. Pass over Shap fells more black, dreary, and melancholy than any of the highland hills, being not only very barren, but destitute of every picturesque beauty. This barren scene continued to within a small distance of Kendall. When read in isolation, these two passages might seem simply to reflect the contemporary vogue for sensationalized landscape description. When we turn to the map, however, we begin to discern that they are as much shaped by the aesthetic conventions of their era as they are by the situation of the roadway that Young and Pennant were following. With a peak, of ele with a peak elevation of some 1,500 feet above sea level, the route of the old turnpike over Shap is notorious for its isolation, exposure, and poor weather. Even today, the M6 at Shap, which rises to only some thousand feet, is considered one of the highest and most treacherous stretches of road in the country. It thus comes as a little surprise that Young and Pennant found the landscape around Shap desolate and oppressive. Many travelers did before them, as indeed many travelers still do today. This is one of the benefits of using spatial models to study historical works of travel literature. It obliges us to examine local descriptions within the broader geographic context of the traveler's experience. Rather than thinking in terms of isolated locations, the models we've developed help to emphasize that these writers were describing journeys from one place to another. Works of travel literature, after all, are not merely descriptive inventories of places, monuments, and buildings. They're narratives that offer first-hand accounts of the journeys of specific individuals. In order to visualize such works adequately, we must employ techniques that are capable of representing the places they mention not as discrete locations, but as a series of interconnected points along the line of transit that constitutes the narrator's tour. It's only by understanding works of travel literature as journeys that we can hope to understand how their writers approached and apprehended the places and landmarks they described. Thus, with respect to Gray, Young, and Pennant, it's only by tracing their journeys through the Lake District that we can hope to obtain insights into how the topography of the region, with its valleys, peaks, and mountain passes, shape the local experiences recounted in their tours. <laughs>